Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon, and particularly uh, thank you to our stellar panelists um, who are going to engage us, I'm sure, in a very compelling conversation. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Um, so my name is Paul Robin. I run the Office of Innovation and Commercialization at UC San Diego, um, and I'd like to welcome everybody here to the latest in a series of conversations where we gather the community to talk about issues that are important to all of us. Um, and this particular issue of inclusive entrepreneurship um, is really important to me personally. Um, while many of us here on the, on the webinar have access to all of the incredible resources, entrepreneurial resources um, that San Diego offers, most of the people in our county and particularly, particularly those in underserved communities do not have access to those resources. And as a result, we are missing out on a large pool of talent. Um, and we, as a community, are the poorer for that. So the question um, for me that arises is, what can we do about that? So UC San Diego, as a public university, puts a very, very high priority on community engagement. And I'm delighted that the chancellor has been able to take some time to talk to us today and give us his thoughts on community engagement, the importance the university puts on that, and particularly in support of those underserved communities. So with that, thank you very much for being here, Chancellor, and I'll hand it over to you. And you're on mute. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this amazing uh, webinar on inclusive entrepreneurship. Uh, it used to be that the term was just innovation and entrepreneurship, and it's been expanded to make it inclusive entrepreneurship. And I think this is not uh, just a simple change. This is a very significant change that shows, that indicates a change in mindset. Uh, and this is really important in this country uh, because where we are right now, uh, we as a public institution are predominantly serving uh, first generation and underrepresented minorities. So for example, at UC San Diego, 38% of our incoming class is first generation. 35% received Pell Grants, and 22% uh, came from underrepresented minorities. Uh, these are significant populations that have a lot to contribute, uh, that have a big impact to make on this society and on our, on our economy. And at UC San Diego, we have a very big commitment to making sure that every individual from these uh, communities has the opportunity to succeed. So we have invested heavily. We have invested in scholarships. We have invested in uh, support programs and summer programs. Uh, and one of the things we are doing right now is investing in innovation and entrepreneurship so that every one of the uh, students from these communities has access to opportunities that many people from well-served communities and uh, higher socioeconomic families have access to. And our commitment is evident from a new building called the U that Mary Walshop would talk about. Uh, in downtown, which is gonna be our connection to the underserved communities uh, between downtown and south of eight. Uh, so I am really excited about where we are headed in this area. Our innovation and entrepreneurship program is uh, campus-wide. Uh, it is also special to multiple communities. We have a veterans innovation program, entrepreneurship program. We have a Latina entrepreneurship program. We have a women's entrepreneurship program. So I can just go down the list you can see that we have used the word inclusive in the most inclusive sense. And I'm really excited to kick this off. So back to you, Paul, and good luck. And you could not find better panelists than the one we, ones we have right now to talk about inclusion and entrepreneurship in the same breath. Thank you. I could not agree more. Thank you very much, Chancellor. And I'll hand it over to you, Greg, right? Thank you so much. Uh, the reason we like hosting these conversations is one of the opportunities that comes out of things like a pandemic or these, is the chance to reflect. And we're always asking ourselves these questions. Not only what are the things we can be doing uh, to move these kinds of conversations forward, but what are also the things we're doing that might be inhibiting entrepreneurship? Um, and also what are the action steps we can take given these uncertain times that can be helping us expand not only our vision, but making us a better community partner. And to that end, this topic uh, fits well in the series where the previous conversations we did, the first one was on the future of education. And the last one we did was on the future of work. 
And we thought that this made a lot of sense since we at UCSD hold in high priority entrepreneurship. But more recently, we are thinking of this concept of inclusive entrepreneurship. How do we reach those who historically have been underserved and underrepresented? and also those communities that may be vulnerable and how do we not only uh, give them access to the same resources that we give uh, um, the students and other people within our immediate campus environment, but also how do we then become a better community partner by um, linking those people to uh, other kinds of entrepreneurship opportunities. And that's why it pleased me so much, not only to have this wonderful panel, uh, but to bring so many friends and colleagues who uh, I worked with for so many years. Uh, the first person I'd like to introduce you to is a longtime friend, colleague, uh, business partner, uh, investor. We've done so much together, um, but his journey has taken him to the pinnacle of this particular topic. Um, prior to his role at Right to Start, which he's going to talk about today, he was the Vice President of Entrepreneurship at the Kauffman Foundation. Uh, and then prior to that, uh, we worked together in a venture firm. And then he worked for a service organization helping entrepreneurs start businesses, going all the way back to the study of law. And um, before that, um, uh, uh, working in grassroots political campaigns. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Victor to talk a little bit about what he's uh, been working on most recently and kind of what led him to do this. And the important thing about these particular conversations we have is that they, you will notice that they will end in a call to action. So this is not about reflection and mere navel gazing. This is about what we can be doing both as a university, but also as a community to begin moving some of these principles forward. So Victor's gonna share some of his insights and also some actionable steps we can take. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Victor. Oh, great. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, Greg's been such a wonderful colleague and partner and uh, mentor to me over the years. And uh, so um, uh, maybe just a quick few seconds about uh, what I'm doing right now and how that relates to inclusive entrepreneurship. So uh, up until uh, the very beginning of this year, I was the head of entrepreneurship at the Kauffman Foundation. The Kauffman Foundation for several decades has been on the very front of uh, leading entrepreneurship as an issue uh, across the country and trying to expand entrepreneurial opportunity for everybody. Um, what I'm doing now is um, I'm actually, I've launched a new organization called Right to Start. And Right to Start is focused on making sure that entrepreneurial opportunity is accessible to everybody, um, uh, regardless of who they are, where they come from, their zip code, their skin color, uh, their background, their heritage, their circumstances. And uh, that seems like something kind of obvious. It seems like, you know, why can't anybody start a business? But if you actually look at the data and you look at what's happened to entrepreneurship in this country, it's actually not very pretty. Uh, entrepreneurship is actually, uh, first of all, the rate of entrepreneurship in this country has fallen by over half over the last several decades. So we actually have less entrepreneurship today than we've had as far as we can track. Um, we also know that um, entrepreneurship is actually harder for certain folks versus others. Uh, certain groups have been hit very hard in the pandemic. So in the pandemic, 22% of businesses now have shut down. Uh, there's a risk of these businesses never opening again within the next few months. Um, but that 22% is overshadowed if you look at certain ethnic groups. So for Black Americans, 41% of their businesses have shut down. For Latin Americans, it's 32% uh, of their businesses have shut down. So pretty uh, devastating numbers. And if you look at the longer trajectory, it's not so great either. Uh, for African-American businesses, they make about a tenth of the revenue of uh, non-Black businesses. Um, uh, for Hispanic businesses, they tend to uh, grow much slower uh, than other businesses. And women also struggle as well. Their businesses start at half the size and tend to grow at half the rate. Uh, and so there's disparities in the entrepreneurial landscape that actually reflect our broader landscape in society. Uh, and the problem with this, um, you know, is that Entrepreneurship is a deeper issue. It's not just about someone else's thing. Entrepreneurship is something that affects all of us. Uh, entrepreneurs, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with this research, uh, all job growth comes from young businesses. So this has actually been proven in many different ways in many different studies, which means that older businesses tend to cancel each other out. They kind of net zero or net negative on jobs over time. It's the new young businesses that actually create new jobs. We also know that uh, new businesses are the ones that create productivity. You can actually track 
uh, GDP, as a leading indicator of GDP is new business formation. So as people start to create new businesses, you start to see GDP go back up again. Uh, and we also know it's tied to mobility. So people's ability to start at the bottom and rise to the top is related to entrepreneurship. It helps create generational wealth that you can pass on uh, and on and on. There's many things that correlate to entrepreneurship and uh, the ability to be an entrepreneur and how it relates to uh, the American dream and, and society as a whole. Uh, so the, the, you'd think then that entrepreneurship would be an important issue in this country. But it's really not. If you actually look at, for instance, the presidential debates that go on or the election cycle, or if you look at the websites of platform issues for candidates across the country at local, state, and federal races, entrepreneurship is almost never on there. They'll talk sometimes about small business, but a small business can be 200 people and it could have been around 50 years. Uh, entrepreneurship is about the new thing and it's about little people, little guys, little gals trying to start something of their own. And that's pretty much not on the American agenda right now. So Right to Start is really fighting to put that on the American agenda and to really make it an issue for everybody. It's not just uh, the three out of a thousand people that start a business every month. It actually affects the 997 who don't. And the 997 who don't start a business in a month actually have a big deal to do with the success of the three. One of the things uh, you find in places like San Diego is there's such a nurturing ecosystem. People help you out. They... They support each other, they wrap around businesses, and they tend to lift each other up when they have entrepreneurial ideas. Um, but it could be better in San Diego, and it could be far better in many parts of the country. San Diego is actually one of the better places in the country to do this. Uh, but it's really an issue because it relates to uh, many issues and problems and gaps in the market we see where it relates to people that have been left behind. So uh, entrepreneurial opportunity and the potential for that to lift up Everybody in the society around them uh, is, is what I'm focused on. And one of the, I'll kind of leave with this action item that Greg was talking about. Um, you know, what do we do about it? And uh, one of the things we do at Right to Start is we talk with policymakers across the country uh, to engage them on these issues. And I was talking to someone on a major political campaign last week and, and someone had asked him, you know, uh, what, what are the issues that candidates decide to have policies on? that they decide to talk about. And he said, it's what we're asked about. And so entrepreneurs are usually hustling too hard to ask about their issues. Entrepreneurs don't talk to mayors and city council people that much. They don't talk to their state reps. They don't talk to their governors. They don't talk to their Congress people. They're pretty busy. Uh, if you've ever started a business yourself, you know, when you're in it, you are absorbed in it completely. And it's hard to spend time to advocate for yourself and to give yourself a voice. So entrepreneurs are pretty voiceless out there. They don't ask the questions, therefore the policymakers don't respond and therefore the country doesn't do a lot for them. And so the issues get ignored. Uh, and so the ask is this, which is um, uh, pick an issue to help entrepreneurs and you know, email or call or reach out to one of your policymakers. It could be a city council person, a mayor, a state representative, a congressperson, even a presidential campaign or your governor or someone like that. And um, what I'll do, uh, Greg told me I could do this. Uh, if you go to our website, I don't know if I can share my web, our website here, Greg. Um, I will try. Here we go. Yeah, I think I can. All right. I'm sure our website. So this is our website for Right to Start. Um, and uh, you can see, uh, this is our cool logo. I'm really proud of this. It's the Statue of Liberty rolling up her sleeve to get to work because she's starting a business. Um, and if you go, and the very top, we're proud of this. Uh, Jim Fallows of The Atlantic uh, recently wrote about us. He called us uh, one of the three guys of the next America. If you click here on policies, uh, we're putting together a policy hub right now. It's pretty simple right now. But if you go here, there's two things. One is ready to start, and the other is America's new business plan. Ready to start is a, a one-pager with uh, policy ideas to help us come out of uh, the current economic crisis. And America's new business plan is a broader policy roadmap um, uh, that's uh, much, much more comprehensive. It's 40 some pages long. It's got 43 ideas and 25 action steps. And that's a big one. That, that's what we published at Kaufman right before I left. Uh, uh, but it's a very, it's a great comprehensive plan if you want to dig into pro entrepreneur policies. But I'm going to click here on ready to start. And this is a one pager and it's got a bunch of ideas. Uh, on entrepreneurs. And these are just four, 11 different topics. And if you want to just pick one of these and just call your, you know, your, your policymaker about it. 
and tell them you care about these issues and want to engage um, and just ask. Because once we start asking, they'll start paying attention. And uh, right to start, our plan is to build an army of 100,000 uh, advocates for entrepreneurs across the country. So sign up on our website, be part of this movement. Uh, we're just getting started and we'd love to have you on board for that. So thank you very much. But Greg, feel free to ask any more questions if uh, I can be of help. Well, luckily, D uh, Doug's already asked a question in the audience and he said, what do the entrepreneurship statistics look like when they're broken down by industry sectors? So are there any sectors that are hit harder than others? Uh, yeah, uh, I guess depending on whether it's the current pandemic or in general over the last few decades, um, I'd say uh, in the pandemic, that data, I'm not as familiar, I, I've read some of it, but I know that uh, IT businesses tend to be surviving the pandemic better uh, than businesses that are retail that require you to go in person. Uh, businesses that are enabled more to, to basically be virtual tend to be doing better. Um, so tech businesses are doing better, but a lot of uh, businesses that require you to be in person are not. Uh, in terms of the broader landscape, it's interesting, uh, the decline in entrepreneurship over the, the last four decades, uh, you'd think that certain sectors have been hit worse than others. It's actually really broad-based, surprisingly. Um, it's pretty, pretty rough. Um, across the whole landscape, there's been what people are calling market concentration, which is the bigger companies have gotten bigger, little companies have stayed smaller, and new entrants have been kind of kept out. And, and we're seeing this uh, measurable across many sectors, and it's pretty distressing if you really think about that's the source of jobs and productivity. So, so that's, the, that's my uh, high-level answer to that. There's actually a great study, if you want to dig in deeper, by a group called the Economic Innovation Group. They're a think tank out of DC, and they wrote a study a few years back called Dynamism in Retreat, which is just an amazing uh, collection of data around um, the decline in entrepreneurship and the decline in economic dynamism across the country. Um, you know, it's something that ring alarm bells about, but doesn't get talked about enough. Well, thank you. And Stuart, one of our colleagues, Stuart, asked a question. So what do you think about the COVID loans and applying for them, particularly as it relates to entrepreneurs possibly applying for them? Um, we've been getting emails about them, but we're not really sure, are they specifically suited to entrepreneurs or, or more traditional businesses? Uh, the COVID loans, um, I think in the Paycheck Protection Program, which is what uh, Congress passed. And I'd say uh, it, is, it is meant for entrepreneurs. It's meant for you know, all kinds of businesses. Uh, in the beginning, it was pretty rough when they rolled it out, but they've, it's gotten easier. The rules have gotten clearer and um, more and more lenders are making it available now. Um, so I'd say it's worth it. They, they, if it fits your business. Now, uh, they do have a lot of rules on it and it does take some time. The best places to go are those that are used to working with small businesses. So I think uh, what the, we found is that larger financial institutions don't take care of their entrepreneurs quite as well uh, and actually may not be as good at handholding people through the application process, which is quite, quite you know, burdensome. Uh, but there's smaller groups that are focused more on smaller businesses that actually do a better job. So uh, if you've got a f financial partner, uh, a bank or some kind of investment institution uh, that you know that actually is doing this, I'd, I'd go with uh, the folks that actually know how to work with small businesses and uh, they can be a lot, a lot more helpful to you. Well, thank you. And this was actually segues into uh, one of the uh, conversations that Mary and I were having yesterday, where she was telling me about some work that some of her colleagues were doing with the Berkeley Roundtable on this concept of uh, the platform economy, on how the very nature of not only jobs, but the nature of the businesses themselves is dynamically changing. And so I'd like to turn the conversation now to Mary not just to talk about that, but about her proactive work that she's doing with a new initiative that UCSD is spearheading in the downtown corridor uh, to address some of these issues that you've just highlighted. Uh, so Mary, I'd love to turn it over to you at this point. Thanks, I'll try to be brief because I think Victor set us up beautifully. But one of the things that I'm struck by having grown up at UCSD and in this community as these extraordinary entrepreneurial clusters have developed is the extent to which entrepreneurs continually pivot to solve a problem, right? They start a company thinking they're going to address one problem. They go out in the marketplace and they find out there's another problem that needs to be addressed. 
And so they pivot the uh, application of their technology or their pitch to accommodate that. And it just strikes me that what happens in the entrepreneurial world, particularly in tech, is that people have access to companies and to uh, populations who have problems that need to be solved and they figure out an innovation that can, uh, that can address that. And one of the issues I raised with Greg yesterday is in the absence of vertically integrated companies, we know that entrepreneurial companies subcontract for all kinds of services, for clinical trials, for food services, for accounting services, for web development services, for IT support services. And if you look at the churn in San Diego, a lot of our entrepreneurial companies are not necessarily inventing the cure for cancer, right? They're providing all the support services to the rocket scientists who are working on the cure for cancer. And the challenge that I think we can meet, and I'm looking at Alex as I say this, is if you're on the UCSD campus or you grew up north of eight, you're steeped in this world of opportunity. And what we can do immediately in San Diego, because we know entrepreneurs are common across all groups. Entrepreneurship is not a privilege. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a drive, it's an energy, it's a point of view. We can connect entrepreneurs who previously maybe didn't have the knowledge of the opportunities that exist in the companies that are on the Torrey Pines Mesa and in a lot of these growth industries and coach them and enable them to start enterprises for which they'll be a customer. Because if you don't have a customer, you don't have a business. And so back to Greg and the Chancellor's point about the U, which is our sort of platform downtown at Park and Market, on the bus line that goes east and west on Market, and the trolley line that goes from Tijuana to UC San Diego uh, on the north-south corridor, we can be a kind of hub where we bring together people with needs and opportunities and young people, middle-aged people who are eager to start companies, whether they be service companies or IT support companies or even a rocket scientist with an original idea. So I think to respond, Greg, to your immediate question, we're opening in a year. Paul and his team is gonna have a significant presence in the building downtown. The Economic Development Corporation is going to be there. Uh, the um, uh, Urban Studies, the Design Lab, lots of resources that were primarily accessible, right, to people living and working and studying in La Jolla are suddenly going to be in a new space. And that means, Alex, new connections identification of new entrepreneurial opportunities, and uh, a lot of support activity to make sure people get a fair chance at uh, growing a company or an enterprise. Great, uh, Mary, uh, Neil asked a question. On the focus on the downtown campus is to open up access to an underserved community. Are we learning during this pandemic that virtual programming and resources is opening up access to a whole new group of San Diego entrepreneurs? Or are we not there yet? And if no, not, I how can we be learning yeah. to measure our impact in that environment? So one of the other things I shared with Greg yesterday is what's happening, because I'm also the extension dean. And the kinds of programs that are growing by leaps and bounds in extension where we give certificate programs and short-term training programs uh, relate to opportunities in the growth area that you were talking about, Victor. So digital media marketing, digital media arts, uh, uh, IT support services, right? Project management, even Six Sigma, right? How to run a lean company 
we're talking about very significant increases in enrollments all online. And so what we see happening downtown is a wonderful mix of online learning that's universally accept, uh, accessible, right? That is complemented by small workshops, networking opportunities, and really business brokering connections between the companies on the Torrey Pines Mesa and the talented entrepreneurs who live across the region. Also, yesterday you and I were talking and you were mentioning the importance of these certificates and badge type programs that it's not about the traditional linear form of knowledge accumulation. Yes, my, my university colleagues don't like what I'm about to say, but I'm serving on a couple of national commissions that are looking at alternative credentials. And I think this is important for inclusiveness. Because if we assume, oh, first of all, you have to get a bachelor's degree, then you have to get a master's degree in engineering. And oh, by the way, maybe you need a PhD in chemistry. And then you can think about being an entrepreneur. Forget it, right? There are all sorts of opportunities, even in tech. The National Science Foundation, I know Victor knows this, reports that 25% of the workforce working in technology companies have degrees in things like history and visual arts, right? They're not necessarily scientists and engineers. And we know, uh, Josh Shapiro presented earlier in this series, 36% of the jobs on the Torrey Pines Mesa don't require a college degree. Now they do require specific competencies and know-how or connections and skills, but many of those can be delivered in three months, six months, you know, training programs, workshops that bring people uh, along. So we're extremely excited by the possibility of expanding UCSD's offerings of short-term, more specifically focused certificate programs that enable people to get into jobs and to build enterprises in the growth sectors. So Mary, one of the questions that one of our listeners or, uh, mentioned was, do you think that the downtown location, the U, is gonna stimulate binational entrepreneurship as well? Yes. Because the good news is that trolley stops right at the border. The good news is that our US-Mexico Studies Center is already planning courses that carry joint credit in with CETIS and UNAM and UCSD. And it's very hard for Mexican students to get up to the UCSD campus for one course. And it's also hard for UCSD students. Our students don't have cars. But the trolley creates the opportunity for all kinds of bridging, collaborative, interactive activities. And uh, we're extremely mindful and we're excited about the EDC being a part of the building because they also have a cross-border vision of how the regional economy will grow. So this question I'm gonna address uh, to Victor and Mary and then we'll readdress it with some of the other speakers. Uh, but someone uh, points out rightly, and we had heard this in a previous webinar as well, that web resources and access to the internet are not necessarily universally available. The same digital divide, oops, oh, someone just removed that question. <laughs> so I can't see it. Um, Rachel, if you could put that back up, that'd be fantastic. And we'll go back to that question when it gets put back in. Uh, yeah, it's actually under the answered. It's yeah, a, I, and, and maybe I can jump in, and I'm sure Alex will address this. If 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 none of if you haven't visited the Connect All Incubator at the Jacob Center, you must, because everything about it, uh, uh, it has all of the look and feel of any kind of tech company you would work in in the Silicon Valley, or in San Diego, and people who are resident or drawing on the resources of that center are really getting access, Greg. Our downtown center is going to have computer labs. It's going to have workshops that we're doing with you and Paul. It's going to have all the bells and whistles that you need to uh, build the case for an enterprise or to do research on where opportunities reside. 
So I agree the digital divide, particularly when we talk K through 12, which is a very, very important and separate discussion from today. But for emerging entrepreneurs, I believe, as Victor suggested, San Diego may be a little bit ahead of the curve because of the kind of work Sylvia's done, Alex has done, and you too, Sadao, in terms of identifying communities of interest with entrepreneurial aspirations who may not have all the tools, you know, all the connections they need, but certainly have the energy and the ideas to be successful entrepreneurs. So I think this is a very exciting time. Victor? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, obviously broadband access and the disparities in broadband access are huge. I, I mean, at the work, at my work, uh, when I was at the Kauffman Foundation, I'd hear stories of what people in, say, rural communities were dealing with, where, you know, uh, high schoolers have to go park their cars outside of McDonald's to get Wi-Fi access because they couldn't get it at home. And, uh, and you see the same issues in urban communities as well. I mean, we're, we're, people have been talking about broadband access for so long, and yet there's still such huge disparities in, in access. Um, yet there are really interesting you know, ways to tackle it. I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, the public utility company uh, actually, is, um, is actually built out their electrical system uh, where the electrical cables actually can carry um, high-speed high broadband. And so the entire region around Chattanooga uh, has widely available, very low cost broadband access for everybody. And it's interesting, uh, as from what I understand and talking to some of the people there, that uh, that model has been resisted uh, by a lot of utility companies across the country. Um, so, I, so, and you know, I don't, I'm not an expert on the politics and all the details other than that uh, it has not been widely copied. Um, but, uh, but I think what it does show is that when these issues aren't raised as you know, major priorities and people don't realize that this is fundamental to people's abilities to make a living uh, and to be able to participate in the economy, these issues get ignored and entrenched interests and institutions will kind of keep the way things are. Um, but when you innovate, there are ways to do it that actually are not that expensive or at least can turn a profit and actually can be worthwhile for the people that are involved in it. And I think Chattanooga is one example and, and you hear about other examples. So I, I think a lot of the resistance has been, well, you're just subsidizing, you know, um, markets that, you know, should be able to take care of themselves, but it's just not true. There are ways to do it that actually can be done at low cost and can, can help a lot of people. Wonderful. And Mary's, uh, one of the uh, people wanted you to um, uh, reiterate the percentage of, um, let me see, because that disappeared as well. Well, uh, the, I, I mentioned two percentages because I did a research, big research project with a colleague in sociology, John Scretney, that was motivated by understanding the large percentage of technology company workers in all kinds of careers who did not have engineering or science backgrounds. Kind of how come? What did they do? to bridge into technical jobs with a general education. But also Josh Shapiro has done work with the San Diego Workforce Partnership and others on San Diego's demand for employees, north of eight, south of eight, across the region and across sectors. And he estimates that 36% of the jobs that the Qualcomm's and the Illumina's and the Thermo Fisher's are hiring do not require college degrees. Those were the two statistics. Greg, you're, you're muted. muted. Thank you so much. Uh, now I'd love to introduce Alex, because uh, I'd like him to talk uh, about what they're doing in the downtown with Connect All and how that is kind of fitting into all these things we've been talking to up until now. Alex? Uh, thanks, Greg. Um, so to kind of piggyback on what Mary and Victor were talking about, first, just sort of we've had some challenges with respect to that sort of digital divide as we've gone completely sort of virtual, right? And so what Connect All the Jacob Center is, is uh, we focus on low to moderate income and diverse founders. We're interested in building uh, businesses that create jobs in the city of San Diego. Uh, and one of the things is having obviously a physical space 
uh, that's great. But then that provides an opportunity for people to be able to be there to get things like internet access if they need access to computers, if they need access to other individuals who have any kind of technical expertise to help them. Um, some of that goes away when you wind up going into a virtual environment. Um, and that's a thing that sometimes people don't necessarily think about where you say, oh, well, just go into a, a room and go on to a webinar or a virtual class. But if you have eight or nine people that happen to live in your home, or if you just can't find a quiet spot, right? Like that is sort of a, a large uh, impact as well uh, that we aim to try to figure out how best to handle uh, but just understanding those are some of the challenges that entrepreneurs who don't come from very affluent backgrounds uh, face um, and they still push through and they're still able to be uh, successful. Um, but one of the things that a lot of folks have talked about that we really want to push for is just that equal access to opportunity and resources. Um, many of our entrepreneurs have figured out how to do amazing things with little to nothing. Right? They've built businesses, they've been able to sort of bootstrap uh, kinds of things, but there is uh, sort of a piece to how do we make sure that they can get additional resources, additional capital uh, to be able to grow that business. And it doesn't mean the business needs to grow to be, you know, a 200 or 400 person company. Um, but as Victor was saying, sort of going from a two person team to a five person team that winds up sticking around for five years has a direct economic impact on an area. It has a direct economic impact on not only those founders, uh, but also their families and the families of the people who they wind up employing. Um, and so what we do is we structure uh, a six month program uh, that focuses on mentorship, providing uh, that training for business foundations, uh, and then uh, also the physical space uh, that we have that unfortunately during COVID, uh, people aren't able to sort of freely kind of move in and out of uh, at this particular time, but obviously in the future they'll be able to. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and at this point, I'd actually like to bring Sylvia into the conversation. Sylvia is one of our colleagues who's worked with us at UCSD. She's been a, a serial entrepreneur and she's also an investor. So she actually puts her capital to work directly into the companies. And it's very relevant because she puts them into the kind of companies we're exactly discussing. Uh, so Sylvia, I'd like you to introduce yourself to talk about some of the ways that you've been addressing this specific problem and particularly long before this became a hot topic of, of interest, you know, in the last several months and even the last year. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Um, uh, such a wonderful conversation so far. Um, love what Alex is doing. Mary, obviously a fan for so many years. And Victor, thanks so much. Um, uh, when Greg and I talked about what was going on, even during COVID and this whole piece of uh, inclusive entrepreneurship, I'm also thinking about inclusive investment. Um, so the same problem that's happening in the entrepreneurial um, ecosystem is having happening in the in the investor world. So both sides of the venture table need a lot of help. So um, that's kind of where I, I live and breathe. And it's been very cool during COVID, especially during the time of how do we get more access to capital to entrepreneurs that are, are underrepresented? How do we do that? How do we create good pipelines? So I'm gonna come, kind of go into San Diego and then kind of come back out of San Diego. So one of the things is the San Diego Angel Conference. So that is a conference that is coming out of USD. It's um, led by the Brink by Misty Rusk and I was her fund manager for Fund One. Now we're into Fund Three. So looking at this inclusive entrepreneurship, we need to get more investors involved in an ecosystem. How do you do that, right? When let's say um, investment amounts are at 25K, a new aspiring angel investors would be like, what? I have to give them that much money? Well, how do I do that? So that access to capital is equally as hard on the investment side of saying, how do I actually do this? So smaller pieces of information or education through the San Diego Angel Conference has allowed people to have units of $5,000 to kind of tiptoe into that arena. And what's really, really important in this inclusive piece is that for diverse um, investors and especially women investors, that tiptoe in is incredibly important. They're risk averse um, um, traditionally. There's um, um, 
of research around the Deanna project out of Babson College that is exceptional, right? So um, if you don't know that project and that research, go find it. It's amazing. So how do we create economic development within an ecosystem based on the investors allowing for their um, capital to be used, right? So that smaller unit size is super important, especially for people of color who are investors, but also for those women um, investors as well. So with like even this year, we were hit by COVID. How do we do that? How do we do access to capital? How do we invest? Well, we just, you know, like rolled up our sleeves, not we, but Misty and all the fund managers rolled up our sleeves and we invested in three companies during COVID. Um, so that piece of determination, Mary was kind of defining what entrepreneurship is, is determination, grit, getting things done. Those roll up the sleeves of Victor. Um, that's the same sort of thought process that investors have to do when everything hits the fan. When you're like, how do I solve this? And as Victor said, you know, the um, businesses that um, are being hardly hit is during, during COVID are people of color and women entrepreneurs. So with San Diego Angel Conference, the same sort of thing. What do we do? Roll up our sleeves, invest, and we invested in three um, female founders um, uh, right at the beginning of COVID. So that's Ag Tools, uh, Noria Water Technologies, and VisiCell Medical. So amazing kind of ecosystem building, small unit sizes so people can get the, the toe in and being able to reach those entrepreneurs that might not have ever reached, um, been reached before. Now, let me kind of go outside of San Diego, and that's what we were talking about, Greg, that you wanted me to bring up. That same sort of thought process of um, um, wealth and wealth management and um, being ha having that opportunity for an investor to have um, um, stake in the game. I'm always about how do we solve this? Write checks if you can. If you can, I understand that. I'm working with a lot of people of color, a lot of people of color who are investors, they might not have that money. I know I've talked to um, on Trish Costello, who is now like um, amazing and an investor. She's a leader of portfolio. Her first investment was in her sister's daycare company. Alex, do you hear this, right? Like write a check to your, your, you know, your sister or your colleague. It might be something very small. You might not be an accredited investor yet, but man, you will become one, right? If you kind of um, 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 grow with the ecosystem. Neil Bloom, who asked the answer, is an active angel investor as well. Those are the types of people that we really need in that ecosystem. So with that kind of definition, um, there was an example, and Greg liked this example, is that um, I'm part of the Next Wave Impact Impact Fund, which is an impact fund uh, made out of 99 ladies. We have 89 women who are LPs, and I'm part of the investment committee, which is 12 of us, um, that we do investments into social innovation. So any kind of entrepreneurial venture that has a social component, either environmental, social, true social, um, justice, and any kind of um, um, impact investment opportunities. So um, what we did was like, okay, at the beginning, well, we knew like December, January, we were trying to build out our third fund, right? So we're like, okay, great. We're going to create this fund and you can invest 10000 to $30,000. We're going to grow this, this ecosystem even more. We're going to have about 98 ladies again um, across the world. And then COVID hit, right? So what do we do, right? Uh, the fund is not going to be created because it's just people's wealth management has kind of gone out the window, right? You're like, what? How do I, how do I manage that? And at the same time, we were um, um, going towards um, making sure that we have a people of color showcase, a founders of color showcase. So the reason why we did that was pipeline issue, right? Is that it was right before the Angel Capital Association, that's a national um, angel capital association summit that happens every single year. So we said, hey, let's tag alongside Angel Capital Association, allow them to see the founders of color that are doing amazing things. I can go into stats right now, but um, that we wanted to kind of mesh those two together. So COVID hit, ACA went um, virtual, we said, we're gonna go and do this. Again, roll up your sleeves, determination, grit, let's go for it. And we said, we can't really raise the fund right now. It's not really gonna be manageable. So how can we shift the financial model to be able to reach those entrepreneurs and reach those investors and 
put them together so that they do invest, they do write checks. So what we did was we said, okay, this is the founder of Color Showcase. Um, whoever wins or whoever is part of it, we're gonna pick about five or six and we're gonna create SPVs, special purpose vehicles. So now fast forward, we have done six SPVs in the last um, month and a half. Three were of um, black male founders. So that was the, the you know, I think I only have five male founders in my whole portfolio, 40, about 40 investments. So um, those three black male founders, I, I just absolutely love them. It's Block Power, Flick Shop, and Lifted. And then we also invested in three female, um, female um, founders of color, Ag Tools, Neopenda, and Uncommon Cacao. So if you kind of put that all together, even in COVID, me as a single investor invested in about 11 companies in the last two months. Yes, smaller amounts, like not my typical, smaller amounts, but diversifying my portfolio. That's something that is actionable. It's something like, how do we create those pieces of um, information, pieces of opportunities like Connect All, right? Like um, different programs that allow for impact investing. We have the Fowler Global Social Innovation Challenge at USD that I'm now a director of. We had somebody from, from Duke win that. It's BioMilk. She's creating um, breast milk out of um, stem cells. What? Right? That's super impact invest. And she got a little bit of money and she's able to go forwards. So write checks, Get that forward, even on investors, roll up your sleeves, be determined. Um, and that's how we grow that, econo that econ economic power in San Diego and also globally. So hopefully, Greg, I covered all the, stuff, the, the pieces that you wanted me to. You did. And I wanted Victor just to quickly weigh in because access to capital is something that's always been important to Victor. And of course, was one of the theme areas when he was at the Kauffman Foundation will be a part of the right to start movement as well. Uh, I think everything Sylvia said is 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 right on. You can get involved in small ways. Uh, another way to get involved is just to be a customer. If it's mm -hmm. a business where you could actually buy a product, uh, you know, uh, you look at all these great products getting launched all the time, whether it's on Kickstarter or Etsy or any number of different platforms. Um, I think you know, be a, be an early customer. Take a risk on something. You know, the early customers are worth so much more than a later customer. Um, as as uh, anyone who's been an entrepreneur knows, you know, those, those first uh, people who support you and buy into it is, are absolutely key. Um, the other thing uh, maybe worth mentioning too is that uh, a lack of access to capital is such a huge issue in entrepreneurship in part because the nature of the economy has changed so much from an asset-based economy to a knowledge-based economy, mm -hmm. which means uh, a lot of the, tr the institutions that used to be great for small businesses no longer are as useful. So banks, uh, banks require collateral. Uh, so you, you need money to start a business. And the thing with banking is uh, when you start a business, you go to a banker, they'll ask to get a mortgage on your house to be able to get a loan. Uh, but so many businesses now are knowledge-based businesses. They don't have assets. They don't have a lot of runway. You can get started from your laptop, you know, create, creating products and, that you're selling around the world. Uh, without even building an inventory. Uh, and so what's really interesting is this emergence of a whole new class of funds that are uh, coming up called revenue-based investing or fin revenue-based financing or profit-sharing models or uh, cooperative models. Uh, and uh, and I, I'm just saying that to be open-minded to different uh, investment structures that are emerging. I think a couple of years ago, there are probably less than 10 revenue-based investment structures, uh, funds in the country. Now there's probably over 100. Uh, they've really been popping up. And uh, it's going to be an interesting trend because they're filling the gaps that have been left behind by the uh, changes in the economy and, and the banking sector. Uh, and uh, I think that's just going to continue. So we're going to see these trend lines keep on moving. And uh, if you are interested in revenue-based investing as a whole sector, there's a, there's a report that uh, we published last year at the Kauffman Foundation uh, on uh, access to uh, capital barriers for entrepreneurs. And there's a whole group of investors now focused on this. If you do Google searches around revenue-based investing, uh, you'll actually find a lot of people doing this work now. And there's some really interesting thought leaders that are emerging in this space. Uh, so stay tuned. I think it'll be interesting to see how these models grow and adapt over time. That's yeah, really no, helpful. Uh, Go ahead, Sylvia. A, a quick shout out to Founders First Capital. They do this type of thing in San Diego. That's Kim Folsom, um, who leads it. A fabulous um, colleague of mine and a director of business development is Oralia Alvarez. So just um, know that it's happening here in San Diego. Reach out. And um, if you want to get connected with them, um, just reach out to us. 
and Kim and is amazing. She, Kim's on our advisory board at Right yeah. to Start, and she is uh, she she is one of the I'd say she's a real thought leader in the space across the country. So uh, folks in San Diego are lucky to have her right there. But Greg, I don't want to steal other people's time, but Victor, you said something that I think is important. Another way to get a company going is to have a customer. And uh, we call it bootstrapping, but companies like Qualcomm, Acadia, we've got fabulous examples on the Torrey Pines Mesa, began with customers, not just investors. And so I think in supporting inclusive entrepreneurship, we can identify both investors and customers. That's really important. So thank you so much. Uh, and of course, we've been talking about how the community is mobilizing around trying to not only identify uh, entrepreneurs to serve, but then how we serve the entrepreneur. But ultimately, we have to hear from the customer. And that is why we've asked Sadao onto the panel today because he represents uh, the customer, the person who not only takes advantage of the educational and support programs we do, but eventually all the financing and other kinds of programs. So I'd like him to kind of uh, weigh in at this point, talk about uh, his organization, entrepreneurs, but also some of the challenges that he sees from the ground truth as to what the entrepreneurs are facing and what are still some of the gaps that we may not have discussed yet that could be helpful uh, to them. Sadao? Uh, thanks, Greg. Uh, my name is Sadao, and you all can remember my name like Sadao. I'm the founder of uh, San Diego Out Entrepreneur. Uh, essentially, uh, first of all, I want to say like, uh, I forgot like who mentioned it. I think one of the panelists said that um, about that um, entrepreneurship shouldn't be a privilege to a specific group. But I feel like I, as much as I agree with that, but I feel like right now, um, we're not there yet. I feel like there are specific hurdle uh, besides funding and besides access to those resources um, that we need to address before that we can achieve um, that goal. And I think one of the things that um, I want to mention is that the cost of being, um, to become an entrepreneur, especially as a minority, is not just the capital and the access to the resources, but also time. Um, because a lot of minority is, you know, like, um, are in like you no know, poverty or are from like low um, low income family, so a lot of people just don't have enough time to actually like you know spend all those like you no know, um, time to look for those resources or to actually um, get educated or do all those type of things. Like for example, like if you are a student, uh, you need to, to go to class, and you need to do homework, you need to like um, like beside all of those things, you also need to basically make ends meet. So you need to also like you no know, get a part-time job, and a lot of time that prevented them, if they're like you no know, talented entrepreneur to have a great idea, that prevented them from having the time to actually um, you know work on a startup or entrepreneurship project themselves. I think that's one of the uh, biggest hurdles that I saw, because um, I met so many people with great idea and with like a lot of potential, and you know it's not that they don't want to make this idea. You know, all those ideas into reality is that they just basically they couldn't afford it like you no know, um, a lot of adults because they have like no family they have like no they have like no kids to feed they just couldn't like you no know, get away from their full-time job so they like what I what I kind of like, hoping to see I mean like this is kind of like a wild idea is to like you know uh, if it's possible to have like you no know, um, uh, some type of like you no know, funding for those like you no know, entrepreneur that can you know, like you know, help them to bridge that gap um, so that they're not burdened by you know like um, you know having to um, get like you no know, part-time job or having to like you no know, um, get a full-time job to feed their family is to allowing them to have the time and energy to actually put into those like you no know, entrepreneurship or, like you no know, startup type of work. And um, another thing that I want to like mention is that um, and it's kind of like Part of my own experience is like being a um, Asian um, entrepreneur myself. Um, growing up in that community, um, the co the culture um, in I guess like um, especially from my family is that a lot of them don't understand uh, why we need to why we want to become an entrepreneur because entrepreneur is like it's a huge risk. Um, it's not a stable job like you know being a doctor or being an engineer. So a lot of times like people don't understand, like 
especially my mom, like they don't understand like why are you spending so much time, so much effort into some into something that you might not see, um, you know, like you no know, um, income for like maybe like you no know, weeks, if not like you no know, years or like you no know, months or like stuff like that. So I think that, um, and for a lot of like you no know, entrepreneur, I think that they um, neglect that type of like you no know, that part that part of the um, emotional support. Uh, because being an entrepreneur, you're not gonna always just like you know, uh, make one attempt and become successful. You're gonna like fail so many times, like you no. Know, um, and a lot of those entrepreneurs who are successful, it's because every single time when they fail, somehow they were able to get back up. And part of the reason is like you no, know, probably they have a better support group, like you no know, people that believe in them, people that they can talk to, that can. Um, help them get through all those um, downfall. So I think having that type of like you know, emotional support of having those type of you no know, group, and that's why I created our entrepreneur is to gather like-minded people so that we can help each other out. And same thing with like you no, know, um, especially being like you no, know, also um, LGBTQ. Um, I want to like you no know, mention that because um, talking about minority like. I know we're talking about like you no know, race and like you no know, uh, like you no know, uh, sex, but we often forget like you no know, sexuality and some people with disability that also falls under um, minority in, in entrepreneurship and their needs could be like different than anybody else's are. Uh, for example, for um, LGBTQ, there's a lot of young entrepreneurs out there that have you know ideas, but you know like because of their sexuality, maybe they got kicked out from their family or you know they have an abusive family that don't allow them to make to basically um, do their own pro uh, do their own project or start their own business and that's something that you know like uh, as a community i think that we also need to address and also like i just want to mention that i'm really grateful for sylvia like uh, brought that up like about whole um, diverse angel investor like uh, diverse uh, diversified investor group um, because I, I think like a lot of minority entrepreneurship, especially for those like are doing innovative or like, you no know, startup project, their, um, their project or their like idea comes from their own experiences. And sometimes, um, their project like, you no, know, um, does not resonate with people that may be like outside of that group. Like, for example, like. Um, I was doing an LGBTQ mobile application and while I was looking for funding, um, a lot of people don't understand, like say like, wait, like we already have Facebook, we already have, we already have Meetup, why do you need to create a, um, you know, LGBTQ um, social application? And that was one of my biggest hurdles. I tried to explain it, but they just don't see um, why it's just like so needed because they, because they themselves never gone through that uh, process of like you no know, coming out of like you no know, sometimes like you no know, they don't want to show their faces on Facebook or on um, or like you know, Meetup. They want that type of like you no know, um, like that in, uh, that inclusive and safe environment. So a lot of those a lot of those things are not something that um, I wouldn't say like a regular investor. I would say like people who are um, who have not been through who who have not um, been in those shoes uh, will understand. Um, so I think that it's very, very important to also uh, create a very diverse um, investor group that would, um, you know, that represent all those like, you know, um, individual that are working on those projects that are targeted to their own minority community. That's, those are wonderful points that I'm going to open up to our colleagues now because we focus a lot on the mechanical and physical aspects of entrepreneurship, the things we, we touch and we absorb. But empathy is a key component of, of entrepreneurship and the cultural aspects of it, things that Mary studies deeply and Victor and I have certainly uh, uh, dug into are really important. So does anyone want to kind of talk about how that then complements all these other activities we do and maybe like what Right to Start is doing to look at some of those cultural aspects beyond merely the access to capital or the traditional things. Uh, well, I can talk a little bit about one of the things we're, we're trying to do at Right to Start is um, we're trying to launch 
a series of what we call start warming parties. And if you think about housewarming parties, so people have housewarming parties every time they, you know, when they have a new house and they invite their friends in and they get to participate and celebrate a new house. Uh, so we're actually promoting start warming parties, uh, which are when you're trying to start something, when you're trying to start a new business, you invite people in and celebrate the process of starting a new business, kind of like like a barn raising was, you know, in America 150 years ago, where people come together to, to help celebrate and launch a new business. Um, if you think about most businesses now, they start pretty quietly. They, they're pretty anonymous. People are a bit embarrassed or shy about talking about a lot of business launches. And, and the reason the start warming party is important, so we've actually had people actually starting to do this. So we get, we're getting emails and, you know, notices from people that are launching these start warming parties across the country, which is really exciting. Um, and if you're interested, you go on our website and you can check it out. We got some instructions on how to do it. Uh, but what the important part of it is that it creates awareness and empathy. So you understand what the entrepreneurial journey looks like. This is why it's important uh, because, you know, starting building a business is so hard and so draining and so lonely uh, that if you can actually start to bring in others and you can share the journey with you, they can help you. They can provide emotional support. They give you validation. They can give you referrals, the introductions, they can become early customers for you. And, and that's the idea of an ecosystem, which is the relationships and the people that you can bring around a business um, actually increase the odds of success of a business dramatically. In fact, there's been research done on this uh, by Ronnie Chatterjee out of Duke University, who's a, a great entrepreneurship scholar. And he found that most people who start businesses actually fail at the simplest steps. They don't get to the point of actually talking to someone else that's done it before. Uh, they don't get to the point of actually uh, engaging with an expert who's actually been involved in their, their business or, or can provide some help to them. Uh, it's like, I think roughly like half of entrepreneurs even make it that far. And so most of the time, the idea just stays as, as an abstract idea. So if you can start to build the relationships around someone with an idea so they can start to feel like they're not alone and they can get access to all that advice and help, uh, you really make a difference. And what, so I think in many ways, uh, communities that are very successful do it naturally. Uh, I think if you go to the heart, the roots of Silicon Valley, that was very much the behavior where people were proactive in trying to help out. And you still find a lot of that in the Valley today. Um, but that cultural aspect is kind of underappreciated in terms of economic impact. Uh, building social capital, the relationships uh, actually has a big effect on the success of businesses and has a big effect overall on the economy. So uh, I, I think uh, it's one thing we need to pay a lot of attention to. Greg, I think there's another thing we need to pay attention to. And I think it relates to people with means and connections who can help entrepreneurs. We all talk about, oh, I need a mentor, I need a mentor. There's fabulous sociological research that says you don't need a mentor, you need a sponsor. The difference between a mentor is he or she gives you their life experiences, they share their knowledge, but a sponsor makes a call for you. A sponsor endorses you. A sponsor gives you early money so that his or her friends will give you money. And I feel that what we miss when we talk about entrepreneurship, and particularly at a moment in time, when lots of successful entrepreneurs and affluent people want to make a difference in inclusiveness, it's not enough to come and give a talk on the UCSD campus or at Alex's center. <laughs> Commit to being a sponsor for a young woman or a young African American or a gay student who's got a crazy idea. And, uh, at any rate, I, I don't have off the top of my head, Victor and Greg, the, the references, but it's very a very significant distinction in terms of the roles that mentors and sponsors play in the mobility and success of the people they support. Fantastic. Yeah. I was going to say, I think it's a, you know, a great point um, about taking from being somebody who's been successful and being able to impart some time because uh, it is in a very, very emotional thing. And a lot of what we do specifically at Connect All Jacob Center, it's like a lot of it is not necessarily the blocking and tackling part. It's really the piece of how do we help people believe more in themselves, right? They've already gotten to a certain point 
And now when they start to get pushback or someone says, that's not such a great idea or look at you, you haven't made money yet. Why are you still working and doing this? Like, how do we create that community that helps people continue to move forward, right? So that they can, you know, actualize and find those things that they really want in building that business for the long term. Uh, and so a real key component of what we've done is, is that community part for people being able to learn from one another, but then also have other people who take in an interest and are willing to invest the time. Like money is obviously very important, but I would say to folks like the time, actually sitting down with someone who, you know, if you've been successful sitting down with someone who envisions themselves being where you are, even an hour can transform people's thought process about where they want to go and how they can actually get there. Uh, so I would, I would definitely um, piggyback off with Eric and like commit some time and then be able to do that uh, moving forward. So one of the questions that several of the entrepreneurs uh, or some of the listeners had asked that are all lining is, you know, part of inclusive entrepreneurship is getting access to certain kinds of resources. Uh, things like the U, things like UCSD, things like community colleges have assets and resources available. Everything, not just from the education, but from maker spaces and laboratories. Does the campus have specific intentions to open up some of these things, not only to some of these entrepreneurs, but also in considering inclusive entrepreneurships to some of these younger entrepreneurs that may not even arrive to college yet? Mary? And respond to that, and I know that Paul Robin will love my response because uh, one of his early ideas for what we would do downtown is to connect to high school students and to teachers, which uh, the University Extension Program, which is going to have a significant presence downtown, already does across the region and link to schools and create opportunities for entrepreneurial experiences and, and contests for younger people. And I think um, this is, it's just a small piece, but it's not a trivial piece. Uh, I can add a bit too, in terms of younger people. There, there's actually quite a lot of resources out there uh, to teach entrepreneurial skills to young people. Um, they could be taken advantage of a lot more. I'll point to three different organizations uh, for people that are interested. One is called NIFTI, the National Foundation for Teaching Entrepreneurship, NFTE. Uh, they have a, a tremendous amount of resources uh, for, for this. Uh, another is a, a well-known group called Junior Achievement, and they've actually they've got a huge repertoire of content and instruction methods for teaching entrepreneurship. Uh, and then uh, another is uh, one uh, called Lemonade Day. Um, there's actually uh, a, a set of resources that actually, you know, teach kids how to start businesses like lemonade stands. Uh, and that's even like for really young kids that participate in as well. It's really meant to universalize uh, youth education. And they're all great resources and I encourage people to check them out. And there was also a question I saw around community colleges someone asked. There's a whole association around that called NACE, the National Association of Community College Entrepreneurship, uh, NACCE. Uh, and um, they're, they're really worth checking out as well. It's a great organization and they have over 300 community colleges involved in that across the country. So it's a, 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 great, a great network for that too. So one of the people actually asked a question relating to the financing piece, Victor, that you might be able to answer around universal basic income. Could that actually help entrepreneurs like Sadao uh, uh, be made available. Is that a solution that you've seen? And are you having conversations about that? Yeah, that is, that's so interesting. Uh, UBI is a big topic of discussion these days. And um, uh, I'll talk about the research um, on this. The research is, uh, there's sort of, it appears that, and I'm, uh, researchers might correct me on this, but it appears that there's a point where yes, you need to have some support. Otherwise people are in such sheer terror, they can't do anything. But then if you get to have too much support, then people kind of get lazy and they don't want to start anything anymore. So somewhere in there, there's a balance point. And it's really hard to find that balance point in society. But I think generally the feeling right now is it's too hard for so many people. There's so many people that are left out because they just can't get out of, you know, living paycheck to paycheck. I think something like half the country is living paycheck to paycheck still, which means that they're not able to, to take a risk. And I think um, so UBI feels like it could be a, a potential use to a lot of people that could use that boost. 
Uh, but I think there have been studies in some Scandinavian countries that say uh, if you have too much support, then it decreases people's risk taking. But Mary, Mary's familiar with the yes, Scandinavian uh, work. Greg, uh, Greg knows I have to sign off in about three to four minutes. And I've done a lot of work in uh, Sweden and the Scandinavian countries. And Victor's exactly right. And this is, I'm not making a political statement, all right? But the rates of startup activity in Scandinavia are growing by leaps and bounds as the rates are decreasing in the United States. Scandinavian students have free college education. Scandinavian students have health care. Their sickly parents get home health care. Again, I'm not making a political statement, but there are certain aspects of the social safety net that free you to be an entrepreneur. And the absence of things like healthcare or high levels of college debt or concerns about your mother with cancer can compel you to get that job in a government agency or to become a school teacher when what you really want to do is be an entrepreneur. So it's possible, and I say this to you, Victor, because you're so policy focused, that there may be certain minimal supports, not all across the spectrum, that enable entrepreneurship, the absence of which may actually discourage entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think these issues of student debt uh, and you know, lack of healthcare affordability, they're, if I've been in this work a long time and there's so many stories of people that, you know, get scared of starting a business because they'll lose access to healthcare uh, because they're afraid of their debt load. Um, those things are just universal. And, and you think about the lost, you think about the opportunity cost to all of us because these businesses weren't created. Um, it's quite significant and, and, and uh, it's a big deal. I wanted to also add, just because I'm trying to get the investor piece, Sadao, you brought up a really good point of the condition of um, minority founders. Um, I'm, I look white, but I'm originally from Venezuela. So um, I understand the, the Latino um, 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 embracing of that, of that culture, because that is what I live and breathe. What's interesting for investors to know is that you have to kind of think about the opportunity cost of your investment, because those entrepreneurs that are very early stage, they do not have friends and family rounds. Just putting it out there, I'm gonna say it to everybody. They do not have friends and family rounds. And you cannot have and ask a startup. I love how you say, Mary, it's like that, 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 that so, the, the social um, aspect of it. Investors need to know that when they're looking at an LGBTQ founder as well, I have invested in them as well, and um, minority founders, they do not have the friends and family around. And you have to understand that maybe it's $25. So what? They put in their money in there and then now you talk about your seed round and allow them to have that conversation with you as a mentor, as a, um, an advocate, as a champion and put money down or introduce them to the right people who don't need to have the, the typical friends and family around that's $500,000 because of who you know. No, that needs to stop. Um, so um, that's just my, my, uh, my soapbox. And what do you guys think of, of crowdfunding uh, for this? Is that a viable thing? One of, the, one of our listeners asked the question about, is that a viable uh, uh, route to use? I mean, I'll yeah, I'll take a, a shot at that. I think um, uh, yes and no. I think it's mixed uh, because, uh, and Greg, you know this research, that a lot of the activity in the online world actually just amplifies the kind of social networks you already have. <clears throat> and so this tends to be a challenge. And you see this happen on Kickstarter now where uh, the projects getting launched on there are more and more sophisticated and requires you to have really polished videos and you actually have to spend a lot of money to kickstart stuff now. It actually has changed the very dynamics of what it was intended to be. Um, so I think it is, it, it's challenging. That said, should we be creating more platforms to allow for, you know, easier fundraising? Uh, yes. And, and the laws are evolving on that. There's actually a whole new set of SEC regulations to try to streamline crowdfunding. And, uh, and that's all good. 
Uh, and I'm talking about Kickstarter as sort of prize crowdfunding, but then there's also equity crowdfunding, which is what the SEC is talking about. And those are all good things to do, but it's not a panacea uh, by any means. And that point that Sylvia was making around, you know, uh, friends and family rounds, you know, just by even talking about that phrase, it's kind of a privileged phrase. It basically says you have friends and family who can pitch in when there's so many people who don't have net worth. And uh, the other thing too is for a long time, a lot of venture capitalists would take pride in saying they only took referrals or warm introductions. And you have to think about like when you, for investors that think that way, what that means, which is means you're basically perpetuating social networks. Like if people weren't lucky enough to, you know, be born into families that put them into good education tracks that put them into the right schools, they wouldn't be in the social networks of district venture capitalists. And you have to think about the lost opportunities because of that, if you're not really open-minded to finding great ideas from, from anywhere. Um, so I think that's just a, a thing to keep in mind. And, and the venture capital industry is actually starting to, you can hear the rumblings and shiftings as that's going on. There was research that came out uh, last year from a researcher named uh, Jennifer Eberhardt at Stanford. And she looked at um, uh, L, uh, limited partner investments into venture capital funds and found that the bias uh, really starts at the very, it starts at the very source of the river, that it, where the institutional money flows is very biased in how they invest into the venture capitalists, which makes venture capitalists themselves very biased in how they invest into entrepreneurs. And so until uh, you can really start to tackle uh, this institutional bias, it's really hard for the entrepreneurs at the end of the cycle to have to deal with it. So I think the, the point of it all is uh, these, there's no sim simple answers because these, these these systems are very deep and the relationships are very deep and the patterns are really deep uh, that it's not just, it's not just the venture capitalist and the entrepreneur. It's the whole system around how that money ends up there in the first place and how the people behave in, in that work. And, um, and we have to be very conscious of it because it just pops up all the time. That's amazing. Um, question for uh, uh, everybody. Uh, but particularly those of you in San Diego, one of the things that distinguishes the San Diego is the cross-border region, the opportunities that exist there. Have any of you given thought to how these discussions we're talking about might also include uh, elements of this cross-border area? And if so, what do you think we might be able to do to you know, see inclusive entrepreneurship in that context as well? I don't see anyone uh, jumping in. Alex, go ahead. So, you know, previously, um, I was doing some work with the Collaborative of Downtown Innovation. We had some work where we were doing some cross-border uh, kinds of things down with MindHub and some other folks down specifically uh, in, in Tijuana and their sort of startup ecosystem. Um, and I think it, it's the same challenge and, and problem, right? There's a bunch of brilliant entrepreneurs who are there, who are working, who are pushing the envelope, uh, and they have the same types of challenges with respect to access to capital, access to additional resources. How do you go about sort of building um, the business, uh, businesses, connection to universities. And so I think it's the same thing. It's not super different just because it's across the border. Um, they're trying to build the same sort of infrastructure that in a lot of cases, especially in uh, some underserved communities in San Diego, we're doing the same kind of thing uh, because those resources aren't as clear. They're not as um, open to being able to provide exactly what someone needs at the right minute. Um, so I think it's, it's really the same kind of conversation. It's like, how do we figure out uh, how best to get people, not only just a resource, because it's one thing to say that resources exist, right? People can do a sort of Google search and find tons of things that exist, but how do you get someone to help the, an individual who wants to build a business and say, come with me, I'm going to take you to this space because you can trust me and they are going to help you in a way uh, that is you know, helpful, uh, but also caring about you, not just as an entrepreneur, but as a person as well. Um, so it's kind of all over the place, but I, I think that it's a lot of the same kinds of things that we're dealing with the challenges here. Nice. Uh, quick question for Victor. Victor, uh, we've talked about inclusive entrepreneurship being a lot of these underrepresented uh, groups, but we very often don't think of people over 50 as maybe one of these underrepresented groups. What are the entrepreneurial conditions for people in, in the over 50 group, uh, like myself and, uh, <laughs> and others? Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm 49. I'm on the verge as well. So um, uh, there, actually, there's actually a whole um, 
uh, it's a whole thing. Uh, some people call them encore entrepreneurs uh, or um, you know, uh, sort of senior entrepreneurs. Um, AARP has actually launched a new initiative within the past couple of years around encore entrepreneurs uh, to actually provide mentoring networks and support systems. So uh, on, senior entrepreneurs can actually be able to you know, access the resources and the help they need. Um, but they're not the only ones. You actually see this happening quite a bit. And, um, and it makes sense because you know, uh, people are able to uh, you know, uh, do run businesses later in life, they, especially with a lot of digital tech uh, services and tools. You can do great businesses uh, without having to you know, fly and travel everywhere. And you can actually do some really great stuff. My mother, um, uh, she's in her late 70s and she's thinking of starting a new business now again. And, and so you just see that stuff and it's actually a really interesting time. So uh, I think it is, there should be more. Uh, and I'd say there is bias in that when people think of entrepreneurs, they often default. I deal with this a lot. They default to a 25 year old you know, wearing a hoodie, uh, doing a tech startup. But the, the truth is entrepreneurs come in all different sizes and shapes and colors and senior entrepreneurs are really important and they deserve a lot more attention. Wonderful. So as we approach the end uh, of the webinar, I'd like to take the opportunity to talk to each of our panelists and ask them this one question is, what should our call to action be? The reason we call these webinars um, innovation at the edge, the future of, is because we want to lean into these conversations. And we don't want them to just be uh, um, rhetoric and conversation. We actually wanted them to turn into actionable uh, insights and things we can do. So I'm going to start actually with Sadao and say, what are one or two things we could begin doing tomorrow that we're not currently doing that might be making the situation better? Or it may be something we're already doing that we probably should re-examine and maybe not do or rethink what we do. Um, I think like I kind of mentioned some of them uh, um, earlier is that I think, I mean, like this is like a crazy wild idea where um, I think that there should be some type of like um, scholarship or like funding like kind of like um, the universal income where you can does like you no know, uh, help entrepreneur to bridge that gap to uh, free their time to, in order to work on um, their own project. And another thing is, um, you know, having, uh, I guess, like expose um, those community to um, entrepreneurship. Um, a lot of like, you know, um, a lot of say like LGBT entrepreneurs, like, I mean, like just individual, they never even thought of um, become entrepreneur just because um, they never seen like a, figure or like you no know, in TV or like you no know, whatever. So they never even thought about that. And because that they associate um, entrepreneurship with like kind of like instability, which is true, um, but you need to kind of like uh, help them to understand that uh, there is risk and rewards and to kind of like basically expose them to the idea and get them thinking about um, actually taking those risks or taking those steps to become entrepreneur. Um, I think those two are the um, two points that I think that we should put on our action items. Alex, go to you next. Yeah, so I would say that there's a couple things under one sort of theme, which is really like just making more small bets, right? Uh, and so from the standpoint of what we do, uh, with the Connect All the Jacob Center, you know, the city of San Diego uh, provided an opportunity to make bets on a lot of different entrepreneurs, right? And so through them coming through our program, we're able to work with a ton of individuals um, that are making these investments and in small bets on uh, the entrepreneurs, but then also uh, from the standpoint of time, right? So if somebody is there, they're listening, they want to help uh, an entrepreneur, don't think about it like I have to have a, you know, a 10 year sort of relationship with helping someone out, right? An hour, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, right? These small things and in increments uh, add up. Uh, and so my thing would be sort of uh, make, make more uh, small bets on many, many more entrepreneurs so that we can uh, increase the number of people that really feel like they have an opportunity uh, to grow uh, their business. Sylvia. I was writing down my things and then I couldn't find the mute button. So sorry about that. <laughs> I wanted to make a true impact. You know how I am. I'm like, action, action, action. Come on. Well, outside of writing a check, like I'm always, 
I'm always like, write your check. Um, if you have funding, it, I mean, even Kickstarter, Victor brought that up, Kickstarter, um, make sure that you are incorporating uh, different people into your platforms. If you're looking for a photographer, think outside the box. Don't go to your typical photographer. Go to another photographer. Um, uh, help somebody on Kickstarter. Um, buy your donuts at Nomad Donuts, not your typical, right? Uh, yes, right? A lot of uh, <laughs> shout outs there. Um, um, you know, hire an LGBTQ marketing person, man, you're going to get amazing marketing, right? Because it's a little bit different than what you're used to. So that's my, my big thing is being aware of your biases. Ageism, we just went through that with Victor. Um, really be aware of that. I know that's not a true action, let's say, but the awareness is the first piece. Then you can make your impact and then you can act on things. But that awareness of, man, I have, when I look at a, at a deal and there's no friends and family, that's actually a bias. I'm thinking, wow, they should be. Well, they really don't need to have friends and family. So I think that that awareness of your biases in general, the questions that you ask, ask more promotion focused questions than prevention oriented questions. Um, be aware that have I mentored somebody in the last 30 days, then go mentor somebody. Sign up with Alex, right? Give of your time. So the awareness is super, super important. And that goes back to empathy, Greg, right? Is that empathy and awareness of what your surroundings are. And then my second thing would be amplify different financial models. So that's what we've done with Next Wave Impact Fund, that there is a funding inequity in the VC world. And what we've seen in, in data is that um, the, let's say investment um, opportunities, if there's a female, there's tw they are twice as likely to invest in a female founder, right? That's from pitch book and all raise and really only women represent about 12% of venture capital. So you see how that inequality is on that side of the venture table. So the more that we can find different financial models that have that tiptoe in um, to be able to break that funding inequity is super important also on the entrepreneur, entrepreneur side, obviously, and also the investor side. So um, that would be my um, forecast into the future, Greg. That is amazing. And Victor. Uh, those are all great. Uh, I love the idea. Yeah, get something on Kickstarter, buy products on Etsy's, you know, go, don't go to the chain store, go to the, you know, the, the, the other, the other store. Uh, I will uh, just ask for one thing for everybody. Um, mark down next week, um, August 12th, which is Wednesday. That's uh, Congressional Startup Day. That's the day that everyone is supposed to reach out to their congressperson, but it doesn't have to be your congressperson. It's fine too. go to your local policymaker, your mayor, your city council person, your state rep uh, as well, and just uh, reach out to them, uh, send them an email and say, hey, this, here's an issue I care about. And, and uh, you know, what are you doing to help, help entrepreneurs? That would be huge. If we can get, you know, all 70 people on this call to do that, that, that would be uh, a lot more than probably happens across the whole country on a given day. So that would be fantastic. So uh, and, uh, August 12th, startup day. Fantastic. And first of all, I want to kind of thank everybody. And I want to apologize for any questions we didn't get to. It's kind of the nature, but all the questions were fantastic. The other thing I wanted to remind all the listeners is we take all this feedback seriously. In fact, all of this uh, conversation is going to be summarized and we present it to the leadership team, not only within UCSD, but within the community and our partners uh, within the community as things we can do. If you have ideas for other kinds of webinars we could do, important topics, important people we can talk to, we certainly rec recommend that. And to that end, uh, Rachel and our team are going to be sending out a survey as soon as the uh, webinar is over, and we're going to ask for your feedback on a couple of topics. This feedback is really important because we do read this stuff and we do take action on it, just like we are taking action on this call. In addition, this entire conversation was recorded. So for those of you who may want to go back and revisit elements of this, or even if you know somebody who may want to listen to this or you may want them to listen to it, we would really uh, like them to do it. And we're going to begin uh, doing these webinars on a monthly basis. Next month's webinar is going to be on the future of identity, what it means, everything from the privacy around it to just what identity means and how we form our identities on the web. And that should be also a good one. And each of these conversations builds upon the previous ones. But of course, we couldn't do this without fantastic panelists like all those people who agreed to give their time today, but also uh, uh, everyone who actually signs up and joins these conversations as well, because this is truly a community and a group effort. 
And before I close, I just wanted to see if Paul wanted to make some final remarks uh, before we sign off and thank everybody. And thank you for your, um, your leadership as well. I mean- I appreciate thank that. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank, thank you. you. Paul, do you wanna say anything? I would just support your comments. Um, thank you everybody for participating and we do take this stuff seriously. So please, any feedback you have, we will read it, we will act on it. So um, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And have a good evening.